explaining the mark of the beast. I can tell you, I have never heard this before. Hello, Sid Roth here. Welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. There are such strange phenomena going on in a supernatural fashion around the world that I have asked my friend L.A. Marzulli, who has spent the last few years of his life documenting these things. I mean, most people read a little headline, but they don't understand how serious these things are and what they are telling, what their signs are pointing to. For instance, have you noticed the increased number of earthquakes, tsunamis, these tragic events, strange weather patterns, uh, sinkholes just mysteriously opening up. Uh, there have even been reports of sounds coming from the center of the earth. They're very eerie. Uh, UFO abductions, and they're being verified. Uh, cattle mutilation, uh, but it was supernatural, not just, uh, just some crazy man doing it. Mystery codes being revealed in the scripture that's predicting the future. Mm -hmm. mystery of the mark of the beast. Uh, L.A., I can see how God handpicked you to do this investigation. Because, you see, L.A. was raised Catholic and he was just disillusioned and uh, he had never seen the supernatural. So what happens, the first supernatural he sees, he thinks it's good, but it's not. It's demonic. He gets involved in the new age and he goes through a whole maze in that. And, and, and he gets pretty uh, high up with uh, a, a, a Maharaji and he's in an ashram mm -hmm. uh, and he's part of this Maharaji's orchestra, does a 10 city tour. And then the highlight, they come to the Houston Astrodome. And there, what was the purpose of them coming to the Astrodome? It was a gathering of, of, of all the devotees of Maharaji uh, into the Astrodome. Numbers were sort of, uh, they, they expected like you know tens of thousands of people. It wasn't the case. They probably had about 20,000 people. But the purpose was, it was called Millennium. And we were told that this was going to be a life-changing event. And it was life-changing for me only because um, I saw something I was on that platform with the orchestra that night that sort of gave me a hint that maybe what I was looking at wasn't what I thought it was. What, what did you actually see? Well, I, I mean, you weren't looking for this, no, no. but you had a revelation of there was something there beyond the people. Mm -hmm. the, there was a large platform which was the stage, and behind the stage was a dais. And the Holy Family was perched on this dais with the guru on the very topmost part of the dais. And this was uh, in, a, in an evening service. And the, the crowd was applauding and, and just, you know, lots of energy from the crowd. And the orchestra played and got the crowd warmed up. And then the guru came out, had this big crown thing on. And I remember my friend nudging me like this and said, you know, take a look behind you. And I glanced back like this. Now here were the members of this so-called holy family, the mother, three brothers, and the guru in the highest part of, it, of, this, of this dais. And as I looked at them, I had no words to describe this or no dialogue to, to you know, articulate it as I'm doing so now. But they did not look entirely human. And what I mean by that, they were human, but there was a power that was emanating, coming through them. And I didn't ascertain or couldn't ascertain at the time whether the power was benevolent or malevolent. I just saw power and it was overwhelming. Okay. Uh, so he, he left that organization. Uh, he decided, eh, enough with this, this craziness. Uh, I'm going to go into business. Things didn't work out too well. He gets a hold <laughs> of a book. Tell me, briefly about that book. Well, it was sort of at the nadir of, of, my, of my journey and, uh, and, and a spiritual walk or looking for something. And um, I was 30 years old and I was reading a book by David Hunt called The Cult Explosion. And as I was reading that book, I was going, Silver Mind Control, been there, asked, looked into that, um, you know, all sorts of gurus, and, and just went little, like a checklist going through each of those things. And at the back of the book, there's this little prayer. I'm alone in my room, there's nobody on television, you know, exhorting me to accept Yeshua as, as Lord and Savior, none of that. And I just read this little prayer and this was it. I just said, look, I don't know whether you're, you're real or not, but if you are, come into my life. And I braced myself like this and kind of waited, looked around, nothing happened, of course. You know, I had that same experience and here's what I thought. Well, I guess it didn't work. It didn't work. Maybe it worked <laughs> for someone else, it didn't thing. work for me. Right. But what happened? Well, about a month later, 
I awakened from an extremely troubling dream. Um, it shook me. The dream shook me to my core, and I woke up just bawling, bawling. And that was the beginning of uh, sort of the taking me out of the kingdom of darkness or that all the occult stuff I had been in and moving me away from that into another dimension or another, another paradigm, as it and, were. And, you know, even though I thought and L.A. thought God didn't hear that prayer because we didn't feel anything, we didn't yeah. see anything, we didn't sense anything, God heard the prayer. And the same thing happened in my life. Literally, the Spirit of God flooded my room. And I have never, I don't understand a backslider. But what I believe, L.A., is that people that were involved in the dark side that then have a tremendous transforming experience, perhaps mm -hmm. like Saul of Tarsus, who became mm -hmm. Paul the sure. Apostle, we have like a supernatural sense for the demonic, knowing whether something's demonic or something is of God, are you finding this true in your life? Absolutely. I mean, everything that that I that I work on and all my all my um, research and investigative reporting, it all comes down to um, looking at what is what is happening. Let's say, um, for instance, there was a something manifested. What I mean by manifest, it appeared in Cairo about two years ago over a Coptic church, and what it was was these these light figures. The mayor was so overwhelmed by this thing that he made sure all the power to this town was completely cut out. But guess what? Even though there was no electric power, these entities, these light entities appeared over this Coptic church and did so for about two weeks. Thousands of people thronged to this area to look at the phenomena that was going on. But see, no one tested the spirits. No one, you know, well, what is this thing? Everyone just assumed it was a benevolent apparition, not so fast. Uh, you, you know, when we come back, I want L.A. to talk about uh, these people that are being abducted mm. by so-called flying saucers, and what does he think this power is? But the thing that is so amazing is they're putting implants in people, and he has actually talked to the doctor that has removed these implants, and he has amazing information. Don't go away. Hello, Sid Roth here with L.A. Marzulli in uh, L.A. I am so intrigued with these people that are being interviewed that mm -hmm. say they've been abducted. Uh, tell me about this doctor you spoke to, uh, Dr. Lear, who started out as a skeptic mm -hmm. of this whole phenomena. Mm -hmm. He's a surgeon. Yes. Tell me about him. Well, Lear was, was asked by a friend to go in and look at this patient who claimed to have some sort of a uh, implant or whatever, something under his skin. And, you know, first Lear just went, figured it was probably a, a wire or maybe a BB uh, from childhood accident or something. But when he, when he found out that the, the person was claiming to have been abducted by so-called aliens, he did an about face and walked out of the room. Didn't want anything to do with this stuff. And in some ways, who could blame him? So he goes in reluctantly. He's sort of persuaded to come back and at least mm -hmm. just look at the thing. Looks at the x-rays. So yes, there seems to be something there. Then, then. So he decides to operate. He goes in. And to his absolute astonishment, what he, what he discovers is very small metallic implant. But over this implant, and this is a, obviously a magnification, I'll use my fist, is a, sec a secretion, a membrane of some sort. And he takes his scalpel and he tries to cut this membrane and he can't cut it. He then takes a forceps and goes in and yanks this thing out. And it comes out sometimes, he's done 16 of these things since, but it comes out sometimes in two or three pieces. What he's discovered is when you take these things out and you put them in a petri dish of the patient's blood, and you just let them, and, the, and the, the pieces are, let's say, separated by a half an inch or an inch. Come back 24, 40 hours later, the pieces have tried to assemble themselves. How is that possible? These implants are giving out a, a clock speed of a frequency, which we believe is a sawtooth, which means it's a computer wave, it's a clock speed, at 300 gigahertz, which is 100 times faster than the fastest computer we have on the planet. Inside these things are carbon nanotubes not found in nature. And other compartments, we have no idea what they're doing. But I asked Lear, I said, in your professional opinion, what do you think this implant is? And in sort of a gruff, and I'll do my best imitation, he goes, well, it's changing the person's DNA. But that's what he believes. And that Did, did you hear that? It's literally going to change a person's DNA. Uh, this sounds way beyond robots and way beyond any science fiction things uh, I, I've ever seen. What is the source, in your opinion? Are there really flying saucers? 
Well, there's two paradigms a person can, can embrace. One is the extraterrestrial hypothesis, that these are entities from the Palladium star system or Zeta Reticular, or, you know, pick your poison, and they're coming here, they're our overlords. I call it the coming great deception, that they've decided to, um, that they created all life on this planet, they genetically manipulated early man, they started our civilizations, now they're back at this critical juncture in human history to usher mankind into a time of peace, prosperity, okay, and knowledge. the science fiction That's people one. go that way. Right. The What's, new ages go that way. All right. What's, what's your I spin? believe that they're interdimensional beings. They are highly malevolent. They are pernicious. They are evil. They have an agenda. It, it goes back to what we read in the book of Genesis, Genesis 6. The sons of God, the Benai Elohim, the fallen angels, saw the daughters of men. It chose for them wives, and the hybrid was a Nephilim. Isn't it interesting that Yeshua says, as in the days of Noah, mm. so it will be when the Son of Man returns. Why is he signaling the days of Noah to us? Why is he pointing to the days of Noah? Because something happened there that is unlike any other time in all of history, and that is the presence of the fallen angels openly presenting themselves on the earth, and I think we're moving into that time. You, you've investigated so, so I don't think there's ever been a time in planet <laughs> Earth there's been so many different supernatural phenomena mm -hmm. and most people don't have not seen the, the the evil or the good the God or the demonic so they're setting themselves up for a big big fall of uh, LA uh, another thing that intrigues me immensely is the discoveries of Torah codes. Mm -hmm. uh, explain briefly what that is. Well, briefly, this is Torah Code 101. If you were to take the book of Genesis written in Hebrew and you were to do an equal letter, uh, equal distant letter sequence, and you can do this by hand, and you go every 50 letters, it will spell Torah. It's amazing. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you know, I interviewed a man that did Bible codes, and I said, show me, look my name up. And I was shocked. Do you know they not only found my name, the name of it supernatural, hmm. but they, they found the name of my wife, her middle name. She has a unique middle name. I've never even heard of anyone beyond her mother that had that name. It's thoroughly. I mean, that was in the Bible codes. I am not a skeptic of these things. Uh, they recently found President Obama in the Bible <laughs> codes. What did they well, find? Well, they did. If you go to Ezekiel 38, chapter Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38? Ezekiel 38, chapter Have you 38. read the headlines lately? <laughs> <laughs> Ryan and everything. Absolutely. <laughs> Definitely. And, and we, I'd love to talk about that. But if, and you can do this without a computer. So you don't, there's no, you know, you don't need a computer mm -hmm. to do this. You can just go to Ezekiel 38. If you can read the Hebrew, it spells Obama. In that passage of all the things that, that seem to be happening right now, President Obama's name was yeah. there? That's, Tell me that Well, again. That's, that's incredibly bizarre. Um, he's the president right now, obviously, and, and we see in front of us these nations. Remember, this prophecy has lain dormant, collecting dust for 2,600 years. And all of a sudden, in the age that we are in, we see Israel regathered back from the four corners of the earth, reestablishing its ancient homeland. They are truly a nation living without walls or gates, any of that stuff, and they're basically dwelling in safety. You know what's so amazing? is these Bible codes even have predicted the future and they've come true. Uh, friends, well, I'll tell you what, when we come back, we'll talk about it, don't go away. Sid Roth here with L.A. Marzulli. And uh, L.A., we're talking about the Bible codes, which are fascinating. Mm -hmm. But uh, what if you took another large book, like, say, War and Peace, uh, and uh, look for predictions in that using the Bible code? What would you find? It doesn't work. Plain and simple, it just doesn't work. It's not okay, even remotely but, the same. But there are things of predicting the future. Mm -hmm. For instance, the uh, Prime Minister of Israel, uh, Rabin, tell mm -hmm. me about that. Well, there was a Bible code that was done with Itzhak Rabin's name and in a very, very tight grouping of letters. Itzhak Rabin, assassin will assassinate. This was done a priori before the event. That's very pretty specific. Absolutely. But it, it even gets wilder than that. Someone found it and went to the Israeli authorities, but obviously they didn't pay any attention. Mm -hmm. uh, what about these, the Bible predicts there'll be strange signs in the skies. Tell, tell me a few. Well, certainly we're looking at um, uh, objects around the sun. 
uh, that NASA seems to redact those images from the SOHO twin satellites. Redact meaning they brush them out several hours after researchers Why? will look at them. Good question. I don't know the answer to that. Tell me about the moon. We looked at films from YouTubers all over the planet who were looking up at the moon, filming the moon, and going, "Hey, I'm you know I'm not a um, an, an astronomer or anything, but I'm looking at this." this body and it's it's not it's not where it should be it looks different it looks weird well if one person says that you kind of dismiss mm -hmm. it but from all over the globe people reporting the same phenomena well, so we did some research on it my partner and I Richard Shaw and what we discovered was we a, a paper by an Italian scientist by the name of Lorenzo Iorio and he wrote a paper called the eccentricity of a lunar surface he thinks that there's a large body coming into the solar system, which is perhaps making the moon act in an erratic way. Well, there was actually a Torah code about the moon exactly. in a particular year. Explain that. Well, the Torah code, which is really interesting, because when this was all happening, my partner Richard Shaw sent it to the rabbis. And so they did a Torah code, and it said, moon will be observed um, in, in, in the date, basically 2011. Um, and anomalies in the, in the lunar surface will be observed in 2011. So the Torah code sort of corroborated what we had been investigating, which I found absolutely fascinating. He has an understanding of the mark of the beast I have never heard before, and it rings true. I think it's historic what you're going to share. Will you do that right now? Oh, I'd love to, and thank you for allowing me to do this. We see in, in Matthew 24, Yeshua states something. As in the days of Noah, so it will be when the Son of Man returns. I alluded to that before. What differentiates those days are the presence of the fallen angels. But there's also some other dynamics in that passage which we overlook. One of them in particular is the length of lifespan, five, six, seven, nine hundred years old people lived. And I believe that's literal. They lived to nine hundred years or older, okay? Hold that thought, then jump over to the book of Revelation. It says, and we all get this one, that anyone who takes this mark will not be able to buy, sell, or trade. That's an easy one, right? But then we find out that anyone who takes this mark, whatever this thing is, grievous sores will appear over the body. Then we find out in the book of Revelation also, anyone who takes the mark is immediately thrown into the lake of fire. There's no grace, there's no mercy. It's just, you've got the mark, bam, you're in a lake of fire. Not my words, those are the words of Yeshua, and those are in the book of Revelation. A little further on, we read something which is not, not necessarily tied into the mark of the beast, but here's the deal. It says that in those days, the days of the mark, men and women will seek death and not find it. How can that possibly be? I've held the chip from Dr. Lear in my hand. I've asked him point blank, what is this thing doing? It's changing the DNA. This thing, and this is how they're going to do it. This is the chip that this people the that go the, into flying correct, saucers, correct. have the surgery, These are the prototypes. By the way, did this doctor find that these people were loonies? No, not at all. All these people that, that um, have been abducted, most of them, I would say over, well over 90%, do not want any notoriety. In fact, they seek um, anonymity. They're not interested in any type of publicity. They just the way, want the thing why, out. Why doesn't the U.S. reveal all the information <laughs> they have on flying saucers? Other nations have done it. Well, the other nations have done it. Um, Greece, um, um, uh, the United Kingdom, France, Belgium, Germany, Japan, Mexico, Brazil. They've all released, related or released, I should say, what were at one time top secret documents. We don't do it, and I think the reason is simply this. They, they fear some sort of a backlash, religious backlash. What happens if people um, all, all of a sudden find out that maybe the God we've all believed in isn't? This is what I call, said, the coming great deception. And I believe it's been okay, orchestrated let's for go thousands back of years. To this changing the DNA. Okay. Why would someone want a chip inside of them? Here's the scenario. Let's say there's a war, upcoming war in the Middle East and we see some sort of a nuclear holocaust. Remember, this is just a scenario, okay? So um, we see nuclear, a nuclear event in the Middle East, perhaps in this country, and all of a sudden, mile-wide UFOs begin to manifest, begin to appear all over this planet. How is that going to affect everyone? But they'll come with two things. They'll come with a free energy source, and they will come with a chip, and this goes right back into what, what Matthew 24 states. They will come with this implant, which when you take it, will usher you, bring you into, as a member of the New World Order, okay? And when they scan this thing, not only will it have its medical records, but it will change and correct your DNA. That's what we'll be told. So, so in other words, DNA. you'll live longer, I You'll guess. live to 500 years disease-free. All this, 
all this. So who's going to say no? Only that's my someone point. that exactly. knows the Lord. Exactly. Only. And you can see why they'd be enemies of the, Absolutely. Of the, of the We'd world. We'd be looked at as Neanderthals. How can you possibly mm -hmm. believe in this ridiculous mythos of a, of a Judeo-Christian God? Why not just take this mark and live disease-free for 500 years? It sounds like a great deal. Mm -hmm. And I look, I've held it in my hand, and this is what I think is coming, and it's the only thing which fulfills all that criteria which we just spoke about that's found in the book of Revelation. And as far as timing, isn't it interesting in this whole scenario of, of what we see shaping up right now of the nations coming against mm -hmm, Israel sure. is on the horizon with Obama's name <laughs> in the secret code. Um, it, 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 this is, it shows you how soon it will be that the Messiah is going to return. Tell me about the rapture uh, vision <laughs> you had, real, real brief, okay. because there is a blessed hope. Um, I didn't seek this I didn't, in any way. I was getting ready to go in the shower, so unlike our last guest, I didn't fast or pray or any of that stuff. I was just getting ready to go in the shower. I was not in the body or out of the body. I can't tell you, just like Paul says. All I know, I was snatched up. I found myself in the heavenly scene. I was there for three seconds. One second, two seconds, three seconds. Bam, back again. Second one, I look around and I can see that we're not sandwiched in like sardines, that there's 20 to 30 feet between myself and other people. We are all looking in the same direction. That's second one. Second two, there is a holy reverential silence which permeates the entire scene. You can hear a pin drop. No one's asking, gee, where are we? There's none of that. Everyone knows exactly what's happened. It's a holy, I can't even describe it. The best words I can, holy reverential silence. The stillness is unbelievable. Second three, I realized to my utter amazement that my sin nature, what I mean by that is all the little nasty stuff that we do that crops up even though we don't want it to. It just crops up and sort of eats at us, our anger, our bitterness, whatever it is. All that was gone and I was liberated. That's in three seconds and then bam, I was back and I wept. Well, let me tell you something. This has never happened to me before, but a few days before this interview, I woke up and I, from a dream, and this is what I was saying in the dream, Jesus is coming mm. soon. Jesus, I said it three times, mm. Jesus is coming soon. I say to you, Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready? An increase in wars and rumors of wars, mass flooding, spontaneous outbursts of Arab unrest, increase of earthquakes, tsunamis and volcano activity, unexplained sinkholes, massive spontaneous bird and fish deaths, increased sightings of UFOs, claims of alien abductions, Torah code prophecies that predict what's happening in the news today. Are all these a wake-up call from God warning us of the events about